Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium's webinar series. Today, we're joined by Joanna Milonic, and she's going to be talking with us about deciphering the genetic basis of cytoplasmic male sterility and fertility restoration in wheat. But before we get to Joanna's presentation, I'll give you a brief overview of some of the things that we're doing in the IWGSC. So we are an international public-private consortium. We have members, uh, 3,200 members in 71 countries, and we have seven sponsors and work with eight, almost 900 research institutes and, and companies. Uh, as I mentioned, the, we have a number of sponsors and they're the ones who make it possible for us to have this webinar series and to do any of our activities that we have planned. So our vision uh, post the reference, the release of the reference sequence and publication of it in 2018 is to enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. We are, our activities this year, despite uh, many of us still being in uh, lockdown or quarantine, or at least not being able to travel, uh, is to continue the IWGSC Arbor Biosciences collaboration to make resources available. We are finalizing the uh, publication and release of IWGSC RefSec version 2.1 and the annotation version 2.1, and we hope to be able to um, announce and release that very shortly. Uh, we are also still trying to secure funding and launching of the IWGSC Wheat Diversity Project that would be based on reference sequences of at least eight land races uh, to show the breadth of diversity in wheat. And then we're also trying to encourage others and work with others to provide pre-publication releases of genome sequences for elite wheat varieties. And as I mentioned, our webinar series. So just to let you know, our next webinar will be the 15th of April um, with Gabriel Kibo Gagnier, and it'll be on the novel design of imputation-enabled SNP arrays for dual hybridization of wheat and barley. And please note, it will also be at a little bit of early earlier time because of the time difference between uh, the various countries. So just as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded, but will be posted on the IWGSC YouTube channel just in a few days. And you can subscribe to the channel so that they, you'll get a message every time we upload a new video. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A period. Please submit your questions in the Q&A panel. Please do not use the chat if you, unless you want to talk to one of the fellow attendees or one of the organizers. Uh, you can already download both pre my presentation and Joanna's presentation it, uh, by going to the handouts uh, panel. And with, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Joanna Milonic from the University of Western Australia, who will give us an interesting talk, no doubt, on deciphering the genetic basis of cytoplasmic male sterility and fertilization restoration in wheat. So thank you for your participation today and turn it over to Joanna and I'll be back for the Q&A. Okay. Um, So I hope that you can see my screen. Uh, you're not in full screen mode yet, Joanna. Mm, okay. Oh. Or presentation mode, whatever. Okay. So I'm probably 
on the wrong on the wrong side. Um, yeah. So hello everyone. Thanks Kelly for introduction. Um, I'll just set my um, pointer, laser pointer, but I think I'm on the wrong side. Um, so hello everyone. Welcome to my seminar about deciphering the genetic basis of CMS and fertility restoration in wheat. Uh, excuse me, Joanna, you're still yes. not at uh, full screen. So I think you need to click the little presentation mode. We're seeing your slides on the left as well. Now, is it better now? No, we're still seeing the same thing. Now we see, ah, perfect, great. Thank you very yes. much Sorry for the okay. interview. Perfect. Oh, no worries, thank you. So should I swap the screen now to this side? Sorry, everyone. Um, no, actually. Um, yes, so thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, welcome to my webinar today about deciphering the genetic basis of CMS and fertility restoration in wheat. Before I start my talk, I would like to I would like to uh, introduce myself and the project a little bit. So I did my PhD in, in Kiel in Germany and the group of Karin Krupinska, where I worked on the chloroplast gene expression. After my PhD and short postdoc in the group of Karin Krupinska, I moved to UWA in 2012, where I started a postdoc position at the uh, Plant Energy Biology Center uh, in Perth, in the group of Ian Small. In Ian's group, at the beginning, uh, I continued to work on the chloroplast gene expression regulation, uh, but in 2015, we started our collaborative project with Lima grain on CMS and fertility restoration in wheat and its application to hybrid breeding in wheat. Uh, the team at Lima grain, team made of uh, expert plant breeders and excellent researchers, is, le is led by Pascual Perez, who's uh, very passionate about hybrids, as all of us are. Um, just a short background on why hybrids are important. We all know that the latest prognosis say that by 2050 crop production needs to more than double to feed the growing human population. And when we look at the current wheat yield gains, we see that they are too small to meet those demands. When we compare the wheat yields with maize or rice, which are much higher, we see that, that wheat yields are actually just stagnating. So we think that by introducing hybrid technologies to wheat or technology to wheat, we could increase the yield. So that would be one of the ways. So why should we grow hybrids? Hybrids, um, hybrids just grow faster. They have higher and more consistent yield. They are more environmentally friendly. They make, make better use of the energy that they take. They make better use of available resources and they are more stress resistant. They're better adapted to changing climate then. In terms of plant breeding, they show higher flexibility in stacking multiple traits. So in theory, they are just better plant varieties. And we know since the, since the 19th century, the potential of hybrid breeds is already known or has been recognized. So I found this very old nature issue from 1886. And in this issue, there is a commentary written by author uh, with initials HE. And this author mentions already there that it would be great to have hybrid wheat. In the commentary, the author mentions several famous plant botanists and plant breeders. And among them is one French um, botanist called Bill Moring. Bill Moring is the founder of the company, a seed producing company with a long history in France, which is now part of the group Limagrain. And in addition to being this 
dedicated botanist and plant breeder, Bill Morin was also a talented painter and he painted here this, this, the sweet hat. So here we are, 135 years later, and we still have no hybrids. We know that it would be great to have them, but we just don't have the way to produce them. So what is the problem? So hybrid production requires a way to block self-pollination to exploit heterosis. And wheat is highly self-pollination species. Therefore, you need a way to force outcrossing in wheat. And you could do this in at least three ways. You could do it manually by simply removing the main flower parts from the plants, but you can imagine this is not applicable on a large scale. You can use chemicals, but they are not environmentally friendly and they are very weather dependent. The third option would be to use genetics, something called cytoplasmic male sterility, CMS. CMS is a natural phenomenon that widely occurs in plants and breeders early discovered, plant breeders early discovered that they could use in their plant breeding. So what we see in plant population is that sometimes mutations arise, which then cause plants to be, to be sterile. And today we know that those mutations are or originate, many of them originate from the rearrangements of the mitochondrial genomes. Those recombination events will produce new open reading frames, ORBs, or new, gene, new, new genes, which when uh, transcribed and translated will cause defects in energy production. Those negative or deleterious effects of the CMS genes can be overcome by nuclear encoded restorer genes. The restorer genes will be expressed and will be imported into mitochondria and their only goal will be to suppress the expression of the, of the CMS causing ORFs here in plant mitochondria. So how breeders uh, can create CMS? They simply take the cytoplasm from wild ancestor, from some uh, uh, variety and introduce it together with the mitochondria and the mitochondrial genomes in the new nuclear background. Normally this new nucleus will not have restore, will not have a gene that will be able to suppress this ORF, therefore the new created plant is sterile. And uh, the, the, the use of this CMS genes here ensures that the whole population of plants will be sterile. So we will have a whole line which is now uh, ready to accept pollen from other lines. So you, you have the CMS line and in the next cross you have to use pollen not from any line but from line that will have restore genes because the hybrid varieties have to be fertile and have to produce uh, a lot of pollen again. So by using, by, by using the RF genes, restorer of fertility genes, we can turn off plant fertility again. And it is great when in the plant system the, the strong restorer genes exist and when the, the genes can fully restore fertility of the CMS plants. And such systems are already established and in use in CMS hybrid and CMS based hybrid breeding in, for example, rice, maize, sorghum, and canola. For example, the Ogo Inra CMS system that is now widely used in uh, breeding of uh, hybrids in canola is, is used almost in all varieties that are grown on the fields all over the world. And uh, Ian was involved actually in the development of this system. And you can see that the hybrids offer sometimes really huge yield advantage over the conventional lines. So it would be great to have uh, hybrid varieties in wheat. So what do we have in wheat? For example, one system that we could use is a system based on cytoplasm from Triticum timofivi. Triticum timofivi is an ancestor of, of or is a one of wild relatives of wheat, and we can use this cytoplasm to produce completely sterile CMS lines. The problem in this system is that the fertility restoration with the genes that we have at the moment, the restorer genes, is only partial. 
And this is like a big disadvantage because of course, in the hybrid, you would like to have the full fertility restoration because you want the hybrid to produce a lot of seeds and be fully fertile. So why is, is this only a partial fertility? And we, we think that it is caused because of the genetic complexity of it, partially because of the complicated genome um, and uh, the consequences of it where we know that, for example, there are already nine restorer genes that we think will be in bred wheat that are identified that are involved in fertility restoration in wheat. So in addition to all those nine genes, there will be also modifier genes located somewhere else in the bread, which, you know, which will also interfere with the restoration, uh, restoration process. Out of the nine genes, RF1, and RF3 are one of the major ones, the stronger ones, um, which have a quite uh, yeah, bigger effect on fertility restoration compared to, to the other genes. And uh, yeah, so we know that the, the complexity and the, the problem that we have and we is at the moment that we don't have a single gene. It would be best to have a nice single gene which would restore fertility. And we, we still hope that if we stack two, three, or more genes, we will have the full fertility restoration, but the best would be to have one, one gene. What we know about restorer genes is that majority of the cloned ones belong to the family of the pentatrichopeptide repeat proteins, PPRs. PPRs are specific to eukaryotes and the family is highly expanded in plants. So whereas humans will have only a handful of PPRs, if you want to know more about what the PPRs in your body are doing, you can have a look in this paper, this review paper here. But let's look in the plants. In plants, there are hundreds of PPRs. And all of these PPRs are located either in chloroplasts and mitochondria where they bind RNA and regulate gene expression by splicing, editing, stabilizing, or directly cleaving RNA. So PPR proteins are defined by the presence of PPR motifs, of course, the PPR motifs, the length of the PPR motifs can vary between 31 and 36 amino acids. The family is divided into P and PLS subfamily. The P family members are made of the typical standard P type PPR motif, whereas the PLS subfamily is uh, made of the triplets or the members of the family are made of triplets of P, L and S PPR motif, where L and S uh, correspond to longer and shorter variant of this standard P type PPR motif. Most of the PLS family members are involved in editing, whereas the P subfamily members are involved in splicing and stabil stabilization of RNA, or sometimes they also cleave the RNA. Mo majority of the identified today RFL proteins uh, or, or genes uh, and coding RFL proteins belong to the P subfamily of PPR proteins. And there are, I think, two restorer genes which encode PLS class PPR proteins, but I think the final validation for those is still missing. Since 2012, we understand how the PPR proteins recognize the RNA targets. There will be a PPR, one PPR motif, one RNA base um, mode where uh, amino acid at position 5 and 35 in each PPR motif really decide where the, where the PPR motif will, which base the PPR protein, uh, the, the PPR motif will bind. So with this PPR code, we can now predict where the, the whole PPR protein will bind within the mitochondrial or chloroplast transcript. If you have some PPR proteins, are you not sure whether it's a P or PLS class PPR proteins, you can go to, to our website and uh, have a look uh, and, and test it and uh, uh, you should get the answer there. Or you can just directly contact us. Uh, so what about the wheat genome? Our analysis of the IWGC reference genome in 2018 revealed that there are 17 hundreds of PPR genes in the wheat genome. So that's the complication. That's where the complexity of the restoration also is coming because there are a huge amount of genes. Um, 700 
of those PPRs are the P-class PPR proteins, and among the P-class, 206 genes are identified as restorer of fertility-like genes. And whereas all the P and PLS class PPR proteins are scattered throughout the whole genome, the RFL genes are located in clusters in really specific locations on the chromosomes. There's a cluster on chromosome 1, there's a cluster on chromosome 6, and there's a small cluster on chromosome 2. And interestingly, the location of the clusters uh, of RFL genes overlap with the location of the cloned or the mapped, sorry, the mapped uh, restorer genes. So RF1 will be uh, mapping to a cluster on chromosome 1A and RF3 will be mapping to a cluster or the, the location will be mapped within the cluster on chromosome 1B. Similarly, RF4 will map to cluster on chromosome 6B. So we think that the and what we also see that in the clusters, the PPR genes have like really high high density uh, compared to all the other PPR genes somewhere else in the genome. And we think that the close proximity of the genes to each other uh, is, is really contributing to the plasticity of the family art, what makes, makes it possible to generate new gene variants through unequal crossover, uh, and, uh, and which will lead then to either changing of uh, gene numbers, you will have additional copies created, or sometimes you will have longer or shorter versions of the, of the genes. So that's the mechanism that we actually um, figure out based on the data that we had from the RISE genomes. And that's what we proposed in 2016. And actually we were really eager to see how is this structural variety in the, in the wheat genome, in the wheat different wheat genomes. So then we looked in the, in the, in the wheat pan genome through collaboration with, uh, uh, with Sean and, and Curtis uh, within the wheat pan genome project. And what we, re what we see is really like high structural diversity uh, among the RFL gene members. So for example, you will see here all the RFL genes in pink in Chinese spring variety. That's some other non-PPR genes in the genome. And when we compare, for example, this region with two RFL genes, with same region in maize between these two genes, you will see that here you will have 14 RFL genes, whereas here in the same region you have only like two RFL genes. And you will also see that there are big changes in the copy number of genes present in those regions. So from those analyses, we knew that in order to identify the, the restorer genes and the and the restorer lines will have to get genomic sequence information for, for each and every line that we will analyze because the structural diversity is just too big to rely only on one sequence, uh, one sequence genome. Okay, so with all this knowledge, we started cloning the sequences of RF1 and RF3. So we started our, our team of plant breeders led by Pierrick Varenne. Um, did all the mapping and all the um, all the analysis of the of the lines that we used and in, in, in an analysis. So they they uh, characterized the lines for the presence of RF1 or RF3 genes. They really nicely narrowed down the intervals on the of the genomes for RF1 uh, and and for RF3 interval on the chromosome 1B. So we really had here really really great material to to work with. Uh, and we, on our side, we developed an uh, RFL capture approach together with the team of uh, Jean-Philippe and help from uh, Georges Duarte. We uh, developed baits with which we could then um, pull down only the genomic fragments uh, that encode RFL genes and then uh, assemble them into RFL genes. And with this method, uh, we would get the information, the genomic information that we need for each line without the need of sequencing the, the full genome. So this approach is like very similar to RENSEQ approaches that you know, for example, for the resistance genes identification. So in our study, we used nine lines. Some of them we knew that they will have RF1, some will have RF3, some will have both genes. There will be two maintainers lines just as a negative control, and there will be a line uh, 
which has a weak restorage in that the Chinese spring grain. So this line was known that will have a weak restorage. And from those um, genomic analysis, we found that most of the of the hexaploid varieties here will have around 200 orthologous groups, which ideally represent genes. And uh, because 3D continuum is a tetraploid species, we found a smaller number of the genes. So this all nicely uh, fit uh, with, the, uh, with the predictions that we had. And of course, 200, that's a quite a big number of genes, but we could do some pre-selection, like we would look for genes which encode full-length proteins, or we will look uh, for proteins which have N-terminus, full N-terminus and full C-terminus, uh, so that, that, you know, that we look for functional genes. We also did some tables like this. Those tables would allow us to select for candidates uh, based on this rationale that, you know, if this is an RF, RF1 candidate, there should be present only in the RF1 lines and should be absent in RF3 lines. We know that RF1 restorer gene uh, originates from 3D continuum Phoebe, so it should be also uh, present in 3D continuum, 3D continuum Phoebe. So with this all information, we were able to create the genetic maps. And in case of interval of chromosome one, which was like really small, we, we found there two candidates for RF1, RFL79 and RFL104, who was showing a small truncation in the C-terminal region. In case of the RF3 interval, the job was a little bit more complicated because there are quite a few uh, genes in the interval. But based on the information that we have that Chinese spring and the RF3 lines should have similar but slightly different versions of the genes, one of the good candidates was RFL29B here and RFL29A. So with those selected candidates, we went to the next step and we just tested them. So for the purpose of the project, uh, uh, the 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 normal fielder line that is normally used in plant transformations was changed, was changed into fielder CMS line. So we introduced the CMS cytoplasm into this line so that this offer us the possibility of direct, tran trans of direct transformation of this line, which is sterile. But when you introduce the restorage, you should start C plants uh, start to produce pollen again. So what we did in our design, we designed the construct either uh, so that the genes are expressed with the um, natural promoter or constitutive promoter, and we introduced them into the sterile feeder plant. And then we waited and waited because wheat takes some time to, to grow. And uh, luckily, after some time we start, or happily for us, some plants started to produce anthers and pollen. So that was like a really, really great day. Um, so, so what do we see based on our fertility restoration estimates based on the T0 events, the fertile events that we see is that the RFL104 and RFL79 you know, that's the two genes that were present in the RF1 interval. RFL104 does not produce any fertile events, whereas RFL79, uh, driven by the uh, constitutive promoter, uh, produce lots of fertile events uh, compared to slightly lower number for RFL79, uh, uh, which is expressed from its natural promoter. For several RF3 candidates, we haven't seen any restoration but then we went to RFL29A and we see that this one again produced fertile events. And uh, here you will see that RFL29 driven from its own promoter is already quite effective in fertility restoration uh, or in producing fertile events. And in comparison, the weaker allele, the RFL29, the weaker RF3 allele produce uh, less uh, of the uh, of the of the fertile events. Stacking RFL 29A and RFL 79 uh, is, is also pretty efficient. It 
produce quite a high number of fertile events, but we are still quite uh, below the 100% um, restoration that we would like to see. So when we look at the uh, expression levels of the transgene, yes, we definitely see that you can change the level of the gene expression by using constitutive promoter, whereas the natural promoters uh, drive the expression at the lower levels. We also did some fertility restoration rates and tests based on seed set for spike and, and per, per year, and, and yes, those genes can restore fertility at quite good levels, but not 100. It's so not of, of those levels that the breeders would like. So with this result, we were able to, or with this experiment, we could validate that our predicted candidate RFL29 is RF3 and RFL79 is RF1. And we uh, confirmed the um, predictions or the observations that we had from plant breeders that RF3 is more efficient than, than, uh, than RF1 gene. Uh, the other experiment that, that we did, we also tested whether it is enough for a restorer gene to be expressed in tapetum cells to restore fertility. For this purpose, uh, uh, team at Lima Grain developed a, a construct uh, with the Zermais MAC promoter, which has been shown to drive expression uh, only in tapetum cells, but not in wheat. So to test this in wheat, they, uh, they introduced this construct where Barney's endonuclease is driven by this promoter and, in, and transformed it into wheat. And what they saw that normally the plants uh, develop normally, but then uh, fail to produce hunters and pollen. So here there will be a picture of a uh, of the one one under here, which is underdeveloped in comparison to fertile plants. So the uh, functionality, after the functionality of this promoter was confirmed in meat, we used it to drive the expression of our RFL29A candidates, that's the RF3 candidate. And what we saw, yeah, that it's it's enough to just express the restorer gene in the tapetum cells to um, to restore the fertility of the plants. So that's, that's like really, really interesting and promising uh, result. So that's one part. So that was the nuclear part of the CMS system. So we still have to now analyze the CMS inducing gene, the, the mitochondrial side of the, of the system. So here in 1993, there was this ORF256, which was proposed as the CMS associated ORF in, in, in 3D Contimo uh, genome. And this ORF256 had actually lots of the typical features of a CMS ORF. So it has ORF to ORF unique region. It has part which is the five prime region, which is identical with the COX1 region. This most likely ensures that the ORF is transcribed using the same transcriptional apparatus that is used to transcribe the COX1 gene. But interestingly, in our fielder CMS line, which you remember it's completely sterile, when we look at the processing of ORF256 by northern blood analysis, we see that in this line, the ORF is already cleaved. So, and by introducing the RFL79 restorations, we do not introduce any new cleavage. So, the, so as a reminder, the hypothesis is that RF, RF, RF gene will be transcribed and the protein will be trans imported into mitochondria, where it will bind to a full length RNA transcript and it will induce cleavage. In this material, uh, our ORF was already cleaved and the introduction of resurgence did not have effect on the ORF. And the ORF does not, um, yeah, um, uh, th th this ORF um, does not, uh, is already cleaved. So it cannot cause sterility in this line. So prompted by this, like, or puzzled by this result in the CMS filter line, we went and uh, surveyed several of A lines that, that we had. And what we saw that still there will be uh, quite, a, quite a couple of uh, A lines which are still completely sterile where the 
cleavage of ORF256 already happened. So, um, happened. so based on this result, uh, on those both results, we concluded that in our material ORF256 ORF cannot be the cause of sterility in TCMS suite. So we went and we looked for other or possible possible candidates in the 3 dcom uh, team of EV genome. So what we did, we did RNA-seq analysis where we compared the expression levels throughout of the genes throughout the whole mitochondrial genome and we compared the read depth in the CMS line compared to NRF line. So if there is a transcript which is high expressed in CMS line should appear as a peak here in those lines. And what we see is that yeah we find this region here in the and the um, 3 dcom Timofivi genome completely un, uh, uh, unsuspected before that we called ORF279 because it, it's composed of uh, 279 codons. So similarly, ORF279 also has a unique region. It also has a part which is identical with the part of ATP8 gene. It has two transmembrane domains. So Again, it has features of a chimeric ORFs that we often, uh, uh, they are often characterized as CMS causing ORFs. We also developed an antibody against the ORF279 protein, and we could detect the protein only in the filter sterile lines. Okay, so if ORF279 is the RNA target of RF1 and RF3, we should be able, so those proteins should bind to this ORF. So we predicted, based on the PPR code, we predicted the binding sites of RFL29 and RFL79 within ORF279 region. And we ordered the RNA probes and, um, and we did some RNA binding assays. And uh, uh, here, uh, what we observed was that the recombinant protein was indeed binding to the predicted target. So RFL29A binds to its target and RFL79 binds uh, to the predicted target. So great. So the next uh, thing to, uh, to analyze or to check was that if the restorer protein binds to RNA, does it, does, is, it, is it able to induce cleavage of this RNA? So we went back to the RNA-seq analysis and we looked at the read depth coverage across the ORF279 transcript uh, across the, the lines that we had. And what we see for filter CMS here in red is that the coverage of the reads throughout the ORF uh, is quite stable and quite constant. Here probably in this region we will still get some reads that will map from the other ATP8 um, normal genes, the gene that is present in the in the TMOFIV um, genome. In comparison, in 3 dcom TMOFIV, we see the sharp decline and decrease in the, in the, in the read depth uh, here in this region. And here we see this, this hard edge and this hard decline in 3 dcom TMOFIV, but also similar scenario we see for the RFL79 protein. So based on this, uh, this pattern of coverage, we hypothesize that the uh, RFL79 protein, the RF1 candidate, most likely bind somewhere up front of the cleavage site, induce its cleavage here at this position. And once the cleavage happens, because there are no five prime exon nucleases in, in, the, in the mitochondria, we will have cleavage, specific cleavage product that will stay in the plants, uh, in the mitochondria, whereas in the in the um, region here, the the once the three prime ends become three, the three prime exon nuclease will come and will and will digest this region. Interestingly, for RFL29, we see that the decline happens a little bit farther away at this place. So this would overlap, or this confirms the binding site of RFL29 to be a little bit upstream of the. Uh, RFL79 binding sites. And here this cleavage product should be a little bit longer, the leftovers that we see. And this we could confirm with the five prime 
uh, race analysis. So here in 3D Continuum of EV, which is known to have RF1, we see the RF1 cleavage product here, whereas the, the bigger, the longer fragment observed in RFI 29 line, we can find not only in the RFI 29 uh, transformants, but also in the to the conventional RF3 lines and also in this line which has which is known to have both RF1 and RF3 specific cleavage product. So with this we confirmed we find two genes and they're what's interesting that they can bind at two different sites and they can really induce cleavage at two different sites of the same RNA target. So this is where we are at the moment. So to sum up uh, we have cloned the Restorer 1 and Restorer 3 in wheat. We have discovered that the previously described ORF256 is not the cause of TCMS. Instead, we have identified the ORF279 as the mitochondrial gene causing TCMS in wheat. We see that both RF1 and 3 bind to ORF279 and induce its cleavers. So what's interesting that you have two cleavage sites, um, neither RF1 nor RF3 alone provide complete fertility restoration. So that's still something that we work on and would like to understand why. Therefore, we will go first into, and check why actually 3D Continuum of EV is fully fertile. We will also attempt further, uh, we will attempt to clone further restore genes. And this project, will, we will continue on this project to collaborate with Lima Grain last year. We get support from the uh, Australian government in the form of a linkage grant. And this time we also have Australian grain technologies on board. This will ensure that we'll have access to the Australian material in our uh, experiments. And we already, um, two weeks ago, we recruited two PhD students to, to work on the project. So hopefully with that, we will have some, some more news on that. Uh, so thank you to our collaborators. Thank you to uh, team at Lima Grain, Tristan Coram from HT. We hope that uh, this project will stay as successful as it is, um, or even better. Uh, thank you to Kelly uh, for uh, organizing, to Kelly and Isabel for organizing the webinar and for, um, for the collaboration within the IWGC um, uh, consortium. Uh, we thank uh, Niels Stein and Curtis Bosnick and Schund for, for uh, the collaboration on the wheat pen genome, Martin Marshall for the, the, the barley, barley genomes analysis. Uh, we also annotate the PPR and MTER families uh, in rice, so MTER family, that's a new, uh, new genes that we think may play a role in fertility restoration crops. We collaborate with the International Rye Genomes Sim Consortium with uh, team and Niels, Victor and, and Bernard. That's a, a really successful um, um, collaboration and congratulations to colleagues for the recently published paper and uh, on the on the right genome. Within Australia we collaborate uh, with Emma Mays and David Jordan and uh, Bob Klein from USDA on the hybrid project. And uh, uh, with that um, we, um, yeah, I just want to say that we are looking for more collaborations. We think that our approach will work in all crops for which enough sequence data can be obtained. So if, if, if you want to contact us, please do so or visit our website. And later in the year, we will advertise a PhD position. So please contact us if, if interested. And thank you to you all for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna, for a very interesting uh, presentation and a very good overview of the paper that you published uh, recently. Uh, we have a number of questions, and just to remind everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, panel or the Q&A section of the dashboard. We will try to get to as many of them as we can over the next few minutes, and even those that we do not get to, uh, we'll provide a way to get the answers to you subsequently uh, to the webinar. So the first uh, question that we have is, did you have a closer look at which development stage the pollen development goes wrong with Timofivi 
CMS cytoplasm? No, actually, we haven't had the opportunity yet. Actually, um, uh, we planned to do experiments uh, like this, and we already had plants growing in the facilities in France, but then that's when the COVID lockdown happened, and ah. we were not able to collect all the samples that we wanted. And here, Laurent, Laurent Bouff was really like instrumental, a colleague from Numagrain, who, who even during the COVID lockdown would go and collect only those a little bit later stages of pollen development. So we never like went to this like really even like earliest stages of pollen development, but that's definitely something uh, that is on our list to do and to, to see when when it happens. Yeah. All right. Definitely. Yeah. So the next I'm going to combine. So the next few questions relate to the uh, restoration rates regarding RFLP RFL 29A and RFL 79, and whether or not there is really any additive effect of stacking them, and if not, why? Yeah, so yeah, that's a good question. And uh, the additive effect that we observe is actually minimal, like almost like I think the the fertility restoration by RFL 29A is already quite high and adding RF1 actually does not contribute that much or does not add that much of an effect that we would like to see. Yeah, so we still still are uh, not getting the full fertility that our plant breeders would like to have. So do you think it's at all possible to be a result of the genetic background? Yeah, there could be other genes also playing around. It could be that there, there are some modifier genes. There are so many RFL genes in the wheat genome, so there could be several genes that bind within the same RNA and could actually interfere with, with each other for some reason. Yeah. All right. Um, the next question is, what is the original source of your Timofivi-derived uh, CMS in, in wheat? Where can it be obtained? So that would be a good question for our colleagues from Lima Grain. Um, I have no idea from the top of my head. Um, but uh, anyone is free to contact Pascual Perez and, and we will be, as far as I know, we will be happy to share the Fielder CMS material. But this would have to be confirmed by the company. So we didn't do the Fielder CMS line at the university. So uh, yeah, but as, as I know, pa Pascual is, is, is a very open person to collaborations. Yeah. So perhaps it's something that we can put in the Q&A uh, section yes. that, that yes. we can publish alongside the video. So yes, yes definitely. Can... Also in the Nature Communications paper, there will be somewhere a section that all the plant material could be theoretically obtained after right. consultation with Lima Grain. Right. So the next question is, uh, the transgenic RFS restore almost completely. In your introduction, you mentioned that restoration is only partial. Can you explain yes. the difference there? Yes. Yes, I think this partial means that it's not complete. Okay, and we still want to have, like the goal is to have 100% so that you can really produce as much seeds as possible. You don't want to left any flowers unpollinated. So um, yeah, so it's 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 almost there, but it's not complete. Yeah, so maybe I should not call it partial. It's like incomplete. <laughs> that would be the, the word. Um, so the next question is: Can you go into greater detail about how the ORF 279 causes? cytoplasmic fertility at the mechanistic level? Yes, yeah, so we have hypothesis about that, that because ORFs like that have this transmembrane domains, we think when the protein is made, especially because it has this ATP8 part, so that's the subunit of the ATP synthase, so the ORF will kind of mimic this original ATP8 gene and will be, the ORF will be integrated into the membranes in the mitochondria and this will cause 
problems with ATP synthase uh, production, pr producing the energy that is needed. So it will just, just disturb the flow of the energy production in the mitochondria. And when you don't have enough energy, then at the flowering time or pollen production time, a process which requires a lot of energy, and we know that because we know that there are lots of mitochondria in flowers, that you need lots of energy to produce pollen. And when you have auros like this disturbing the energy production, uh, then you at some point just decide, okay, we have not enough energy, we should save energy and we stop stop flowering. Very interesting, right? Yeah, but that's, that's like more or less hypothesis, which we should, uh, yeah. How would you go about actually exploring that? Do you have any thoughts yet? Oh, not that many yet. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, like with the antibody, we can show that we can detect the ORF279 in the membrane fraction. So we know that it is integrated in the membrane fraction. I'm sure that there will be some assays how you measure the energy levels at the energy production in mitochondria. So we could try use those assays and see whether we see differences between the mitochondria from CMS plants or from, from normal plants, I think. Well, we look forward to hearing the results of some of these experiments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it would be super interesting. Luckily yeah. in Plant Energy Biology Center, we have lots of plant mitochondria specialists. So I hope that, or I'm sure that we are uh, prepared for uh, analysis like that. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Have you shown ORF 279 protein localization to a mitochondrial membrane? I haven't done it any um, fractionation or like detailed fractionation of the of the mitochondrial proteins. So I have like this crude mitochondrial extract that I was able to extract from like very limited material that I had from CMS plants. Uh, that were flowering. So we had some enriched fractions, mitochondrial fractions. Um, yeah, but yeah, we should probably look into it as well. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> How did you identify the total number of gene family members in from the reference uh, genome assembly? Did you use a specific algorithm? And is there a common, is it common for any genome or any gene family to be able to have that? Um, so to identify, um, to, to, to annotate the PPR genes as a family, we have a, a small, small script, a small, small JavaScript, which is actually published in one of the papers that we published a few years ago when we did a big analysis of the PPR family in a in a 1KP project or maybe in the paper that starts with redefining the PPR motifs. I could post this information as well. So, so we have HMM models for the different PPR motifs that are also, I think, available somewhere on, on GitHub. So anyone who has a little bit um, uh, uh, in like knowledge on using bioinformatics and almost any, anyone today can use a little bit of, uh, of small scripts uh, should be able to annotate the PPR family. And within the PPR family, we can then discriminate the P class. So by using our PPR finder script, we can then divide the proteins automatically in the P and PLS class. And within the P class, we can then look for the RFL genes and the RFL genes are easily to be identified because when you use all those sequences and generate uh, a tree, just like a normal, normal uh, phylogenetic tree, you will see that all those RFL proteins or genes group in one clade apart from all the other PPRs. So there will be some other papers from our group uh, that explain how we can use the Phylo, phylogenetic approaches or even orthoMCL uh, database to identify the RFL genes in, in those genomes, in different genomes, in any plant genome. Right. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> can you please share a little more information on the RFL capture approach? Is the 
PPR motif used to capture the RFL sequence itself? Yes, so theoretically what we did, we first did a quite big analysis of different genomes that were available at the time, that would be probably somewhere in 2015, 16, there will be some draft genomes of wheat and barley and some other cereals. We will identify the RFL sequences and then we will use those sequences to, to generate the bait. So that, that will be just fragments. So the fragments that we use to generate probes, the probes were then made by a, a specialized company, they will be made just based on the RFL sequences. So not on the all PPR sequences that you have in the genome, but from the beginning we selected the RFL genes. Therefore, when we did the capture and then uh, we analyzed the genes, um, we saw uh, that actually what we pulled down was only RFL genes. So there is small faint difference between the, the sequence of the RFL genes um, that or the PPR motif in those genes that kind of discriminate them from all the other PPRs. So once you find the, the clade and design the probes just to target this, this clade, um, it, it should be, uh, uh, yeah, it should work. I think the fragments were, were bigger than a PPR motif, but uh, I don't know this exactly from, from the top of my head, but we will have, uh, have it described in the material and methods section in, in the paper. And if someone has more questions, uh, please send them to me and uh, uh, I will uh, consult with my colleagues from Limagrain how we could help. Great. That. So <clears throat> the next question is, do you have any plans to do any allele mining uh, and specifically targeted sequencing for novel RF alleles across diverse wheat? Um, genomes or, or varieties or relatives? Yes, so definitely we would like to do some allele mining. I'm not sure whether at the, uh, we would start from the beginning with the RFL capturing of the sequences. Probably, I think we were discussing that first we would do some PCR, some just like pre-selection of the line. So for example, if we would like to look for the different variate or the variation, for example, in the sequence of the RF3 genes, we would first design some primers that would be really specific to RF3 region and would, we would try first to screen which lines at all will have RF3 and then probably we would um, do some more work on these genomes. But uh, yeah, probably it would be quite a big effort to screen thousands of accessions or hundreds of accessions from the beginning, just by the RFL capture. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we would do some, but probably we'll first pre select, do some pre selection. On the right. So, the last question is um, often RFL action seems to be altered by modifiers. Any ideas as to what these are and how they fit within your model? Yeah, so uh, a modif in our like in our discussions, we think that the modifier gene could be another PPR gene, which encodes, for example, not a fully full length uh, functional RFL gene, but it binds somewhere within the sequence and disturbs the other uh, the other RFL genes. Um, also, the other option would be just another gene family. That's uh, the, the family of the MTERF genes, the new family that uh, uh, was discovered actually in, in RAI the first time, that those genes could be involved, or one of the uh, cloned restorer genes in RAI is an MTERF gene, and there were some modifier genes, I think, in Bali that were identified as MTERF proteins. So there could be some interactions between PPR and MTERF genes. Um, in, in the genome that could modify the, the, hmm. the, the restoration. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you very much for the webinar and answering all the questions. We do have a number of other questions and just to let everyone know what our procedure is, we uh, give these questions to Joanna and she'll respond and then there will be a written Q&A document that is uh, located along with the uh, video recording. So 
don't worry if your question did not get asked during the presentation, it will be answered uh, herewith. So thank you all for participating yes. with us today. And, and again, Joanna, for a, a wonderful presentation and it's really interesting work, what you're doing. We look forward to the future uh, results you, on some of the things that uh, you mentioned today. So we look forward thank to you. seeing everyone uh, again in our next webinar it's on the 15th of april and until then we hope all of you will stay healthy and enjoy the springtime yes see you everyone bye-bye bye-bye thank you